I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son. Something tells me that when you say these words each morning when you get up, and each evening when you go to sleep, the words at the beginning of Luther's morning and evening prayer, you are not always thinking about them as you say them. You have that sad trouble that I have as well, that the prayers may be on our lips, but they are far from our hearts. You may utter thanks, but you have not really given consideration for what has gone right in your day and the blessings you do have. And if you did think about that one word as you were wrestling with your pillow, it might cause you to sit up in bed and wonder why it is that Luther included it at the forefront of his prayer. Thanks? What do I have to give thanks for? But maybe you would be able to go to sleep, content yourself, thinking that maybe somewhere out there, one of God's children has something to give thanks to him about. Thanksgiving? We leave that to once a year on the holiday at the end of November before Christmas. It is in this context that we consider the next words before us tonight. Last week on Ash Wednesday, we considered how every time we celebrate Holy Communion, we remember not only our Lord, but very surprisingly, we remember Judas. We are never to forget the betrayer that is in our midst and our need to repent and be drawn back to the Lord and his words for you. So this night we continue on. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks. Yes, on that night, the night when he would accept the bitter pill for your sake and mine. This night when he would be handed over to die. It was on that night he gave thanks for a measly slice of bread that was in his hands. And let me tell you, this is our Lord that we're talking about here. This was no half-hearted, routine prayer that we might speak, but a true, heartfelt outpouring of his heart. Thanks, God, who sends the rain to give us our bread. Thanks, God, for giving us this our food. Thanks, God, for all you have done and will do for me. Yes, Jesus, your Lord, was about to suffer hell, and still he gives thanks. Jesus gives thanks. It really is remarkable. For ever since Eden, what has been lost to man is the giving of thanks. The Apostle Paul himself describes this problem in Romans chapter 1 as he describes and gives an overview of the entire unbelieving world. For what can be known about God is plain to them. God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their futile, foolish hearts were darkened. Man thought lost his thankfulness, yet Jesus came to bring it back. One of the purposes of Jesus' coming was to bring a spirit of thankfulness back to God's people again. I'm not, not, I'm not talking about big thanks, but the simple small thanks where we are thankful for so much as a morsel of bread or that we have it so good even if we live in a trailer. The kind of thanks where people look at us and say, what do you have to be thankful for? How can you be so thankful? What's with you Christians? It is this thanks that God gives again in Jesus' cross and here in the Eucharist. 
The simple fact of Jesus taking bread and giving thanks was a cosmic event that rattled the cages of hell. Jesus brought thanks, brought the ability to give thanks back to his people. For us, this giving of thanks is associated always with the cross. Jesus died for us, and so we can give thanks. We can thank God even in weakness, in sorrow, and in death. Jesus puts this bread of thanks into our very hands. For this bread is his body which was broken and given for you. Your life can be filled with thanksgiving. For all that is needed stands done. In your hand is thanks and joy and peace. It's all that you need in this life. Jesus gives thanks and you are covered by his giving of thanks. He covered your thankless heart by dying for you. He gave thanks even on the cross. All thanks has been given and done. All work has been given and done. So your life can merely be a daily thank offering that is given. And when you fail at that, you are forgiven. Christ's death and his giving of thanks covers you. He gives thanks. And this thanks is characteristic of our communion service, especially the second half. It literally spills backwards from the words of institution and forwards from it also. The word appears so many times surrounding our Lord's Supper that the ter term Eucharist or Thanksgiving has become a name for the Lord's Supper. A few times that we say that word in liturgy include very familiar words. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, the pastor says, and the people respond, it is right to give him thanks and praise. The pastor then says, it truly is good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. After we receive the gift of Holy Communion, what does that old Lutheran collect say? We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And what of that other response right before that? Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. In the supper and in seeing what he was thankful for, what he was thankful for, Christ brings thanks back to his people. The last words in the liturgy before the benediction, let us bless the Lord, the pastor says. The congregation concludes with the last sentence of the liturgy. Thanks be to God. God works by giving thanks back into the lives of his people and giving them this bread and in giving them back thanksgiving. Well, I don't have anything to give thanks for. Really, is that how you feel? It is certainly how you sometimes act. What a tragedy that your heart is so cold to what your Savior did that night. When about to face the cross, he gave thanks. He gave thanks for you too, that he could take the cross for you and give himself for your sake. Now, it may be a small point, but we'll conclude this night with this thought. Jesus never made his bread. It was the devil who tempted Jesus in the middle of the, of the wilderness to make his bread. Turn these stones into bread, the devil said. To make bread in so many understandings means this, to provide for yourself, to do it yourself, to take it unto yourself. But Jesus never did. Jesus waited for his bread. He waited to eat what God would give and when God would give it. So on this night, it is a very small point, but we see that Jesus did not make his bread. He takes bread. He takes what was given, what was given by his Father. He accepts what God places into his hands. And he takes it even though for him it means a cross. In so doing, Jesus teaches us not to make things of our own doing, but to humbly take what God has given. As Christ takes and gives thanks, we take and give thanks also.
The words about eating and how the disciples ate with our Lord that night bring up a whole host of biblical thoughts and images. We remember how Jesus ate with tax collectors and sinners. He still does. We remember the children of Israel who hungered in the wilderness when they had no food and ate the manna that came from on high. We remember the feeding of the 5,000 in the wilderness when the people were hungry and Jesus gave them loaves and fishes to eat, of which there were plenty. And Jesus said to those who came to him a day later, after he had fed them in the wilderness already, and they wanted more bread. Do not work, he said, for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. Christ gives us what we need. In the bread and in our daily bread, he gives us what we need. And for this, he returns our hearts to thanks. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.